Hi everyone, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Blaschenberg, and I'm your host of Yoga Birth Babies. And today we're going to talk about the need to normalize formula feeding. Something that we discussed in this podcast and this conversation was about choice. And something that those that have taken class at PYC know that I am all about offering choices and education so that however you choose to birth, it's your choice. I don't have any stake in the game. My job is to support you for however you want to birth your child. But that doesn't always seem to be the same when it comes to feeding your child. In fact, in this conversation, I talked a lot about kind of the side eye when people are formula feeding or bottle feeding and oftentimes the guilt that parents feel when they make that choice. And what my guest brings up, Jane Freeman, talks about is how breastfeeding can have a narrative of being too militant and how breastfeeding can also contribute to negative parenting experiences and a lack of confidence and postpartum depression and anxiety. It's a really interesting conversation and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. And then there's also some practical information about how to choose a formula. Should that be the path you want to go? So I'm really excited for you to hear this, but let me tell you a little bit about my guest, Jane Freeman. She is a certified childbirth educator a breastfeeding counselor, and a postpartum doula specializing in mood disorder prevention. And after the birth of her two daughters, Jane started a public access show about birth and parenting titled Mama Rama. Jane has some fantastic information and just a really down-to-earth way of talking about the importance of normalizing bottle feeding, formula feeding. So I think you're going to get a lot out of this. Before we jump into that conversation, I just want to give you a little update about all the fun things happening at Prenatal Yoga Center. So we have added another workshop to our on-demand workshops. It is now a newborn care workshop. So we have all the workshops that we have in person now on our on-demand library as well. It is so exciting to me that you can choose when and where to take your class. Maybe you're joining us in the studio in New York City, or maybe that's not a possibility. So we can offer you that same opportunity to get this fantastic information on your time, on your schedule, wherever you are. So check all this out. It's on our website, prenatalyogacenter.com. So besides our workshops, of course, we've got our classes and we've got an online class every single day. And of course, in studio classes as well. So you can join us again in on the Upper West Side. You can join us online. We have re-releases. So you can, again, take this whenever you need. It just makes me so excited to see how things have flourished and we've burst beyond just our four walls in New York City. We are now, you know, online everywhere. So check all that out. The last thing I want to go over is about our teacher training and our upcoming post- Partum or postnatal yoga teacher training. So four times a year, we do our prenatal teacher training. And then once a year, we do our postnatal teacher training. It's going to be in May. So all of this, again, is also on our website, prenatalyogacenter.com. And then as I always like to take a moment and just take a moment of gratitude and thank you, the listener, for listening, for being part of this community. And if you have a moment, I would greatly appreciate if you could leave a rating and review for the podcast. You're listening. I hope that you're enjoying it. And the way that other people can find this is through our ratings and reviews. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to do so. All right, that's enough of me. <laughs> Let's take a moment. And when we come back, you'll get to hear this great conversation with Jane Freeman. Hi, Jane. How are you? Hi there. I'm well. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm excited to jump into this topic with you. I know that we did an Instagram live about this, but I want to go deeper. <laughs> talk about formula feeding because I feel like there's so much so much conversation about breastfeeding. And then I know the students at formula feed, they kind of like run sheepishly and, and I don't want that. So I want them to, you know, have that opportunity to feel normal with their choices, not, you know, hiding behind them. So before we dive into that, I'd love to learn a little bit about you and how did you get into the birth world? Um, I got into the birth world basically by giving birth. So (laughs) after the birth of my two daughters, I was just really, it's just 
enamored with the whole process, the being pregnant, the giving birth, and what life was like on the other side. So Mm -hmm. After my second daughter was born, and that was a really crazy birth, it was 90 minutes from start to finish. Holy crazy. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, when people talk about like, oh, we might not make it to the hospital in time, I'm like, listen, 90 minutes. I was in the Holland Tunnel on my way to the (laughs) hospital, and I was already pushing, and I made it to the hospital in time. So anyway... um, (laughs) No, but I was, uh, I had moved from, I was a longtime New Yorker and I moved from Manhattan to Jersey City and I was not that thrilled with it. It Jersey City 20 years ago was very different than it is today. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things I did to make myself feel better was I started my own public access show. It was something I always wanted to do. When I was in New York, I was always really intrigued by the idea, but in New York, it's really competitive to try to get a public access show. Um, so I learned really quickly in, in Jersey city, it was totally easy. (laughs) People had nonsense on public access. Like literally, literally there was a guy who would like, just look into the camera. He was lit by two candles (laughs) and he would read the tarot cards for the entire Zodiac. Like he, he would just go through like, Aquarius, (laughs) Aquarius, <laughs> you're feeling kind of out of sorts this month, but that's because your moon is in retrograde. Like he would just <laughs> come up with these things. He's very like generic Zodiac thing. And I was just like, if he could do that, I could talk about something really interesting like birth and pregnancy and, 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 and trying to breastfeed in public and all the problems that I'm having with my adjustment to motherhood. I was like, I have, I have juicy topics here. And so they gave me a show, like sight unseen. I was like, wait, don't you want to see my like audition tape? And the guy's like, have you seen what's on this channel? (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, that's the sort of informal way that I got into it. And then over the years, I just... I got to ask, I got to ask, do you still do it? Your show? Uh, I had to put it on hiatus because I was so busy living life, having, you know, being a single mom, eventually, like I became a single mom. My girls were young. I was teaching like, no, I had okay. stopped it, but then I restarted it just recently. Oh, that's so so it's still called Mama Rama. It's on YouTube. And, um, so there's shows that are like 15 years old where I'm like, Oh my I'm gosh, I got to check this out. <laughs> I'm talking about like circumcision, you know, what do you do when your kids get lice? You know? Um, I mean, those two things are very unrelated, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, just pa- parental things. And, uh, and then, um, uh, oh my, so my recent incarnation, I'm trying to do more stories. So I told mm. the story of, um, Semmelweis, the the doctor from Austria who believed that women were dying of childbed fever because the doctors were examining them with dirty hands. You know, Mm -hmm. know, I'm sure most people in the birth world know that story, but you know, your average lay person doesn't know it. So, so I tell that story. I tell a story of like why forceps aren't used anymore. I make it a little bit more, you know, kind of informational sort of Mm -hmm. thing. So that's what, that's how I'm doing it now. And I just kind of re I resurrected my YouTube channel, but it's really funny because there's videos on there that are literally from like 2005. I have like little, little children with me and my girls often busted in, you know, on camera when I was recording a show, it was very, very informal. I have to check that out because it also sounds like interesting topics. So, and still relevant. I mean, my kids had lice like maybe five months ago. Like it's a pain in the neck. So I get it. In fact, (laughs) I would look at that again. So so that's perfect. All right. So let's start to dive into what we were going to talk about, normalizing breastfeeding. So I guess let's start with a little bit of a brief history of how society and expectations, I know I'm like jumping from lice to this, um, <laughs> society. But and wait, Deb, I have to yeah. interject. You said normalizing breastfeeding. Was that said, a Oh gosh, story? that was, a, that was, <laughs> oh my gosh, thanks for catching that. We'll keep that in. Normalizing formula feeding. Thank you. For, um, you know, that just goes to show that I that know. slip was yeah. what I'm so used to talking about. I will be very honest. I think this is my second podcast about formula feeding, and I've done probably 
I don't know, we're at like 300 and something podcasts. So I would say I've probably done maybe 30 or 40 podcasts about breastfeeding. So that just goes to show that we need to put a little bit more focus on formula feeding. So back to it, normalizing formula feeding. There we are (laughs) out of my mouth properly. So let's talk about that brief history of how society and expectations played a role and how we're told to feed our babies. And this is a huge shift because I'm a child of the 70s. Um, I just had a big birthday recently. And when I was talking about feeding babies with my mother-in-law, she's like, of course we bottle fed. That is what we did. That is what was done back then. And my mom's like, actually I breastfed. So it was interesting that it's, it's a change of perspective, even in this, you know, small lifetime. Yeah. I mean, for women who are pregnant today, they only know what they know. They only know what they're exposed to. They're taking classes, they're looking on social media, they're reading books or listening to podcasts. So if the general consensus by the greater population is breast is best, breastfeeding is what you do, breastfeeding is normal, it's natural, it's good for you, it's good for the baby, they're there's not a lot of opportunity to really challenge that. And in many cases, I think this is really interesting. When I teach, I notice that people will often say, you know, I don't even know if I was breastfed or not. So these are, my students are generally, um, born in the eighties, some in the early nineties, you know, just kind of like the age that people have children. That's when they were born. And you're right. Breastfeeding was not as big of an issue. It was kind of like a little bit more unusual to breastfeed a baby at that time period um, than it was to bottle feed. And you have to think about where did that come from? Was that, were, were people just listening to their pediatricians? There was no social media. (laughs) Certainly there were books, but there weren't the kind of like bombardment of influence that occurs now that makes you think that this way is the only way. Mm -hmm. Does Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. So, all right, let's go a little bit further into formula feeding. So, it was interesting when Andrea from City Births introduced me to you. One mm-hmm. thing that I thought was very interesting was the fact that you teach a formula tutorial and you're very pro formula, which we're going to talk about. But that's not actually not super common that I find for a lot of postpartum doulas and breastfeeding counselors, which you are. So, no. <laughs> so tell me what led you to your passion for focusing on formula feeding. Right. So I, I I do feel like compelled to defend that a teeny bit because, please, because in, in our world in the birth world to be sort of labeled as being super formula positive is often seen as like, like some kind of a polarizing argument that if I am that way, then I must be anti breastfeeding or be somewhat critical of breastfeeding or have some, th- there's just sort of set up into the dichotomy of how we feed a baby, right? Mm-hmm. We only have two choices. Like, I just, I just want to make that really clear. <laughs> it's not like we have an array of different ways to feed a baby. You have A or B, right? Mm-hmm. So, so, with all of the messaging and influence being so strong in breastfeeding, I was under that influence too. Uh, When I got formula from the hospital after my girls were born, I threw it in the garbage. I looked at it as though it were poison. So, you know, I was indoctrinated to it too, I just want to say, and that is kind of the correct word in a sense, even though that has, you know, its own implications. But And then when I became a teacher, I was fully like, you know, breast is the way we have to go. And I will teach all the things that I'm told to teach that are more or less anti-formula. I felt like it was my mission as an educator that I was, I had to let people know, you know, formulas, no, it's not as good. You really should be breastfeeding. That was the sentiment that I had for my whole life up until I became a postpartum doula, which was seven years ago. So my career in the birth world is about 14 years. So that's half of it. So just, you know, to give you the chronology there. So what happened was 
working as a postpartum doula, I started to see how the rigors of breastfeeding were really difficult for a lot of women. And that wasn't my experience. So I didn't have this kind of like, oh, I know what, yeah, I know what it's like. I've been there. I I just didn't have that level of, I, I couldn't relate to that. And so you would think that I would have been much more cavalier about like, oh my God, yes, you know, breastfeeding. If I could do it, you could do it. All these women, we have all this support. Just think about the level of support we have in the New York area, right? Everybody right. sees a lactation consultant in the hospital. There are lactation consultants covered by most health insurance providers. This cracks me up. We even have Boober, right? So we have a lactation service based on the immediacy of an of of Uber as you know as a model mm-hmm. for like you need you need lactation help. You call this number. You go to this website. You l- look it up on the app, and we can have somebody at your house, you know, within hours. There's a lot of support for that. Anyway, I'm getting away. No, no, from- I, I, I like this. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I became a postpartum doula and I started to see the challenges that women were having, I was just a little surprised by that. I, you know, I just saw like all of these difficulties were not just mechanical. They mm-hmm. weren't solved by okay, we need to get a better latch. You need to get a tongue tie release. You need to pump more. They weren't all solved by that. And they were creating an enormous amount of anxiety Mm -hmm. and sometimes leading to depression and what we would label as postpartum mood disorders. That's what I was witnessing, not just once in a while, but all over the place. And so I had to reschool myself. I had to look at the bigger picture here. And to just sort of clarify it in a nutshell, I realized we were not prioritizing the mother. We weren't prioritizing her mental health, her well-being, her need to sleep, her need to heal, her need to feel autonomous. We, we, it was like we bulldozed right through that for the sake of the baby that must be fed, fed breast milk. That's how I saw yeah. it. And, and it really upset me. I had like a complete epiphany in the first year of being, <laughs> that's a long time epiphany, <laughs> in the first year of being a postpartum doula. I was floored by this. And then I just decided to make maternal mental health my specialty. So so to do that, I needed to feel good about formula so that I could teach my clients about it, so that I could help them feel positive about it, and and also to give people some empowerment of choice, you know, to not just yeah. feel like oh, all American formula is garbage. Like a lot of people have that sentiment. So the more I learned about it, the more I got deep into understanding the nutritional comparison and what's in formula that's not in breast milk and vice versa, and being able to speak about it with a lot of authority, the more I was able to help my clients. And I have all sorts of clients. Don't forget, there's some that like will never be able to breastfeed. Or I work with two dads that's not happening. They're not breastfeeding. I work with people who are adopting babies. They're feeding them formula. I work with people who've had double mastectomies. They're not, they don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. It is, it's such an amazing feeling to say to someone, this, this is okay. You're baby is going to be absolutely fine. And we're going to find you the best formula that you feel good about and that your baby does well on. And we'll get into, and I'm excited you said that because we'll get into the different formulas, but you said something that really kind of lit something in me. So throughout, and I bet you'd probably relate to this. So I feel like there was this influx of uh, unmedicated births for a long time. It's like, that is the standard. I think that came about right around when business of being born yes. came out. And so that's like, that's kind of aligns with where you are in the birth world 14 ish years ago. Mm-hmm. And there was a couple years before my son was born. And I remember seeing like going to the, when it was released and like hearing a, a panel talk with, um, the, the, uh, 
Abby, Abby Epstein, yeah, Abby Ricky Epstein Lake. and Ricky Lake. So I remember hearing that. And for a while, everyone's like, that is the gold standard. That is what we <laughs> go to. And then those that and those were in the studio, like, well, I'm not going to do that. And I definitely, and I will admit, I think I got on that bandwagon for a bit and then it shifted. <laughs> I don't know at what point it shifted, maybe like two, three years later where I'm like, wait a second, pause. It's about choice because while I did choose home birth for mainly because I was a doula already and I didn't love the hospital settings that I was seeing, that's just my personal choice, not a, not a choice for others. But so I chose that. But what it came to later is that I really teach about is it's personal choice. And it's something that we are so strongly believing in at PYC is I'm here to offer you education and choice so that you make the choice right for yourself for your family. But what I'm hearing and I'm realizing I'm very guilty of is that choice also should be about how we feed the baby. It's not. And I feel like what you just highlighted is like, while everyone's like birth, however you want, it's your choice. I don't feel like we put that out as a society of feed your baby, however you want. I still feel like it's looked on kind of with the side eye. Absolutely. And I grapple with that all the time too. And I try to use what you just said as an analogy to help other people that I'm talking to and other birth workers for that matter, to kind of understand that the direction we always want to go in is one of choice, not sort of militancy, right? Well, let's we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to talk about that. So actually, let's take a super quick break. When we come back, I want to hear your thoughts because I know that you feel strongly about we have a current breastfeeding narrative about being too militant. So let's take a quick break come back and talk about militant breastfeeding. Okay. <laughs> we'll be right back. Okay. We're back. So let's jump. So I want to hear, tell me more about your thoughts about how and why you believe the current breastfeeding narrative is just too militant. Okay. All right. It's very simple. When we talk about natural birth versus medicated birth, right? We're, we're often a good childbirth educator, anybody working in the birth field, certainly understands that not everybody is going to go about birth in the same way, right? We understand that. So your comfort zone was having a baby at home. That could be someone else's worst nightmare right. and vice versa, using the hospital as the opposite. So we understand that. The thing is about feeding a baby, all the emphasis goes on the other the, the other person in the equation. When you make a choice to have an epidural, you're really impacting yourself and your own birth. But when you make a choice to feed a baby breast milk, you, it's good for you and it's good for the baby. But really, the emphasis is really on the baby. When people mm -hmm. talk about the benefits of breastfeeding, and we know there are absolute there are studies that show that breastfeeding is very good for the, for the mother, right? We know that. But all the emphasis is on the baby, all the wonderful things that breastfeeding can do. And then we kind of tie it all together by making it seem like, well, it's a bonding experience. It's the flow of oxytocin. It's the closeness. It's all of these things, which are not untrue, but they aren't there for every single woman who is breastfeeding. They're there for the women for whom breastfeeding is going well. The, that, what I just described, is not there for the woman who is having challenges. Mm -hmm. so, so in a nutshell, I feel like it's the woman's choice for how she's going to give birth because it's very much this, it, it's, it's her journey. There is no other way to do it. She's got to get the baby out of her body. Nobody can like step in and offer a substitute for that. But with breastfeeding, it's all about the baby. All the emphasis goes on the baby. And that's why when you see a post, for example, this week, a couple of days ago, parents Instagram made a post about, I'm going to prioritize my mental health over breastfeeding, there was a lot of mm. angry pushback to that. You had women saying, wow, that's selfish. Wow, breastfeeding, not for the weak. All sorts of judgmental <laughs> comments that 
yeah, you might be able to apply that to somebody getting an epidural, but we don't really see people do that. Do, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? Do yeah. you see women sitting around going like, oh, mm, I'm looking her, she had an epidural. You know, like, I don't feel like people are that judgy about it. They might be internally kind of be like, well, you know, that's the way she did it. I did it my way and I think my way is better. But we don't really verbalize that in a, in a sort of tit for tat competitive way. Mm-hmm. But no, no one seems to have any compunction about doing that when it comes to feeding your baby. And I really think that it's because it's seen as a, a more or less selfish or, or selfless decision to work hard to breastfeed or to quote unquote, give up and to formula feed. And I'm saying quote unquote, cause I always tell my clients, we're not going to call it give up. We're not going to call it anything negative. It's we're transitioning to formula. So that way you don't feel like you failed at an endeavor. I love that because I've had many students, in fact, as we talk about breastfeeding, bottle feeding, I had one of my friends, I was her doula for both her births. She was adamant to breastfeed her babies. And her first one, it did not go well. Mm -hmm. She was doing, she saw like every doctor, every lactation consultant, and she suffered. I would watch, I'd come in and she literally had her nipples in two bowls of like salt water. Like she suffered, but she stuck with it because she believed that's what she needed to do. But I was watching from, you know, the lens of her friend watching her exhaust herself. And then when she had her second, we had a talk about this. She's just like, I don't think I can do that again. And I said, you don't have to. And something came over her. She's like, I don't, I don't have to. Cause I think she saw that in hindsight, I think when she was in the midst of it, I don't think she really saw that it was an option not to, but after it, and then seeing, looking into possibly doing it again, she recognized she didn't have to. And it turned out that her second child actually, whatever, it was a, it, it, it worked differently. Um, mm-hmm. But there was that moment of realization. She's like, I don't have to. And I think of her every time someone is suffering and just kind of that switch where she was, she, I don't know if the word's excited, but there was something that softened when oh, she yeah. realized that was, but it was like, it was, she was, emotionally suffering. And I don't think she recognized that. I'm guessing you probably see that with your clients too. Yes. That's exactly what, when I said I had my, (laughs) my epiphany, I was seeing a lot of that suffering. And so now we've used that word several times here, and that is not what gets presented to you when you take a breastfeeding class or even what a lot of prenatal classes will... that doesn't come into the equation. We we don't like to talk about that side of it. And if it does get talked about, then it goes hand in hand with, well, I guess she didn't have enough support. That's what we always hear. Um, and the truth is, and, and again, I can only speak from my experience in the New York area. I know that there are different breastfeeding endeavors and different or or lack of support in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. So I'm certainly not speaking with a worldview here. I'm really speaking about the New York area. And we have a lot of very highly driven women, women who are accustomed to succeeding. Uh, They're self-described as type A. They want to do things right. Mm -hmm. And if they are told that it is critically important to breastfeed your baby, That's where that comes in, the dynamic that you just described with your friend or your client, because the the struggle is, is such that there's almost nothing else that we would put ourselves through with that degree of suffering. But, but the sacrifice to feed our baby is one that we feel is tied up in our worthiness as mothers. And that's where it gets dangerous because I've seen women spiral into postpartum anxiety and depression and OCD, having intrusive thoughts, 
having massive sleep deprivation that is fuel on the fire of those mood disorders. Mm -hmm. And much of it is coming from this self-imposed, I I must get this done. I must do it right. I have to feed my baby from my body and I'm not backing down even if I never sleep again. Yeah. And then obviously, so this goes to the importance of normalizing formula feeding so that one doesn't I I hate using that word failure because it's not a failure, it's a choice. But I feel like people experience that. It's almost like that awful term, failure to progress during labor. Like I've had students come in, they're like, my body just couldn't do it. I had to have a C-section. I'm like, that's okay. That was your body's process. That's how your baby needs to be born. So I feel like we have the word failure way too much in in the perinatal world. It makes me really sad because parenthood is hard enough to feel like anyone has failed at something and then have the anger at one's body. I mean, that's a whole nother topic. Um, but so <laughs> what, what are ways that we can shift to a more positive, normalized view, um, raising formula feeding up in the same way that we support those that choose to breastfeed? Right. Well, The thing is, it is, it is hard to say to someone, you know what? It doesn't matter. Breastfeed, formula feed. It doesn't matter. We have a lot of ways of saying this and sometimes in comical ways. Maybe you've seen a meme that says, uh, they're all going to end up eating French fries off the floor of the car, right? You've seen things like that. Right. Because that gives a little levity to the situation, which when you're in it, does not feel funny at all. Right. And, and it seems like the only women who are, uh, you know, okay with making jokes about it are they're you know, they have four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, and they think back of how much they tortured themselves when they were new mothers, you know, again, going with that description of like the, the, the pain, the, uh, the pumping, the lack of sleep, the, you know, the, the medical procedures and so forth, the ordering supplements that are unregulated from Canada, like all of these things. I, I just feel like, you know, people the second time around relax a little bit. And the reason they relax a little bit is because they're like, you know what? Everything ended up being okay. My baby, when she went to daycare, didn't get any more sick than my friend's baby who was breastfed until she was two years old. Like you start to kind of put it in perspective and just say like, uh, you know, I, I put too much weight on something that was maybe presented to me as more important than I think it was. And that's where it gets tricky because people want evidence. They really want to sit there and say, Mm -hmm. can you, can you actually show me that it's okay if I, if I don't breastfeed, like I'm going to end up with a perfectly healthy, uh, non-obese, non-diabetic baby who's going to be just as smart as a breastfed baby and just as bonded to me. You know, those are tough things to prove. And and, you know, a, a lot of our clients like I'm Emily Oster for that reason, that she's going to crunch the numbers for you, basically look at the quality studies and say mm-hmm. something like, you know what, it's a lot of those claims are correlations. They're not, they're, 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 they're not great studies. They don't really give us conclusive information that breastfeeding is going to be that much better Um, And again, that's a slippery slope. People don't want to hear that necessarily unless they're open to hearing that. And they're like, good, tell me more. Tell me it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I come in. So your question was about like normalizing. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I just, when I talk to my clients, I put the emphasis back on the mother. I say, we have to prioritize you because if you're not okay, guess what? You're not going to be able to bond with your baby. Breastfeeding bonds you with the baby when it's going well, when it's snuggly and delicious. And you know, your baby is like milk drunk when she's done nursing. That's amazing. But you can have that same experience snuggling your baby with a bottle against your body. And if you're feeling mentally better by nourishing your baby with something that your body couldn't produce, then that's a win-win as well. Why would we look at that as something negative when Mm -hmm. that that is bonding. 
Yeah. That's important. I really like that. And I will make sure that we do link to some of Emily Oster stuff because I do like that she crunches the numbers for us. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the different formulas out there because there are many. So in preparation for this, I just did a research, like a little Google search of formulas. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there are so many. There's soy, there's just like so many. So how does one start to look for advice on choosing the right formula for their baby. Well, so that is why I do the formula tutorial that you mentioned earlier at city births. Um, and, and and I do it for my clients over here as well. I, I, you know, I, I try to educate as many people as I can, uh, because it is a little more complicated than it's presented to us. Um, when, when I used to teach for Tribeca, part of our presentation was all formula is the same and it isn't the same. And that is just a silly thing to say, because if you just look at one brand, like you look at Similac, there's like 10 variations Mm -hmm. of Similac and they have different names. You know, it might be pro total comfort, pro total, this pro, this pro that gentle, this gentle, that I don't, it may, there's a million different marketing, you know, tags that are put on it. So why would we say it's all the same? That's really oversimplifying. And, um, uh, in America, we've only really had three major formula companies for the longest time, Similac and Famil and Gerber. But in more recent years, smaller companies have sprouted up and have an offer what I call boutique formulas. They cost more, but they're more controlled in how they're made. There's attention to the quality of the milk by using um, milk from cows that are raised on sustainable farms who don't get pesticides in their grass. They're all grass fed. They don't have antibiotics. They don't have, they don't need anti-inflammatory medication. So the milk that they produce, we perceive as being more pure, more clean as the average, uh, dairy cow that's, you know, per- producing at a, a massive amount in the, uh, the dairy farms of America. So like, you can just start there with like seeing a huge difference. And this also came from a great interest in importing formula from Europe. So that happened, I don't know, let's say five, five years ago or so it started to become very popular. And I think the formula companies were starting to see a dent in sales. So they, got together with the FDA and said, can you put a stop to this? Because they're not regulated to sell in the United States. And you got to find something that makes the, our public feel like the European formulas are dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so what they came up with was that European formula does not have as much iron as American formula. And there we got into like a whole formula war over that where people were like, Oh, Oh, that's terrible. But not really understanding maybe the European scientists got it right. And maybe our scientists got it wrong. Maybe we're putting too much iron in. Like there, there wasn't really like a good discourse on it. Mm-hmm. What, that, that, that the FDA sent out press releases to every pediatric practice in the country, basically. And so I was starting to see people saying to me, oh yeah, I, t- I talked to my um, doctor about switching to European formula and she said, absolutely not. And she talked about the iron levels being different. So there was, you know, again, we, we thought we had like a good solution, you know, for moms who or, I'm sorry, for parent, any parent who wanted a, an alternative to the American, um, monopoly. Actually, it's that other word with an, an O. Agalopoly. <laughs> Do you know the word? Type? No. It, it's it's like beyond monopoly. That okay. like that, that that's how much, and I, I can never remember how to say it. But I know somebody out there will be like <laughs> trying to correct me. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, I mean, talk about a stranglehold. You know, it, like that's all they offered, and then we had some a better product, and then it would they the FDA tried to put the kibosh on it, which backfired enormously when we had a massive formula crisis and shortage because one Similac plant went down. And um, for contamination, which is like a whole other issue when things are being mass produced. Anyway, so flash forward, now we have Bobby, which is a boutique formula, By Heart, which is excellent, Kendamil from the UK, they finally allowed that to be imported. 
but Bobby and By Heart are made here in the U.S. and are tightly monitored and have their own, you know, they, they just, By Heart in particular, came up with their own recipe. So these are the things that I talk about so people have a much better understanding about what makes one formula different from another, either within the same brand and then from brand to brand. But I just want to say one little sure. wrap-up statement here. Fundamentally, the macro and micronutrients in all formula is pretty much the same. Everybody's in agreement that we need this much protein, this much carb, this much fat, this much vitamins and minerals, and then we're good. Can those things fluctuate or be manipulated within formula to formula? Yes. But ultimately, a doctor is not 100% wrong by saying formula is essentially the same. But what about within, like you said, within the same brand, there's different types. Does right. How would something like, and I was looking at more sensitive and then soy, you know, no dairy. So how would somebody go about choosing that? Is it, or is it really just preference? No, it's not preference. Everybody should always start with a basic level formula. Okay. We, we don't want to go to a specialty formula. So let's pick a brand like, uh, and okay. So you don't want to go to a specialty formula if you don't need to. I compare that to, it's not the, a perfect analogy, but I compare that to always drinking lactate just in case you were lactose intolerant. Right. Okay. You, you didn't need to do that. You didn't need the specialty item. Okay. So when we see language on the label, like gentle, comfort, soothe, anything, any sort of synonyms to those words, you're looking at a formula where the lactose has been reduced. Milk sugar is lactose. That's a carbohydrate. So if we take out the lactose so that a baby's digestion does better with it, it has to be substituted with a sugar. Mm. So anybody who picks up a can of formula in the supermarket, turns it around and sees something like maltodextrin, corn syrup solids, um, or sugar on the label right next to whey protein and something else like a, like a fat, uh, uh, like a vegetable fat, mm -hmm. they're going to go, Oh, what is this? Why is this formula full of sugar? See, this is why they tell you that babies who have formula are likely to be more obese. And so it's a big misunderstanding because not all formula is lactose reduced. Only the ones that have the gentle or the soothe or those kind of words on the label. And again, that's just designed for fussy babies. We know babies get fussy. We know that they have gas. And then when you give them a formula that has a hydrolyzed protein and has lowered lactose, they typically do better. Mm. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. This is going to be a little above and beyond. I didn't, I'm just bringing this on you, but do you know of either a website that has this, or do you have a handout or something that can break this down for people or your webinar? <laughs> um, mm, I don't have something off the top of my head that breaks it down. That's, that's an interesting idea. Maybe I should provide some, Oh, Oh no, I, I do have a good idea. Um, there are a couple of people on social media who uh, have big followings and they're, they're strictly about formula. So on Instagram, there's Mallory Whitmore. She is called the formula mom and she has a lot of material that you can either pull from her website or you can, you know how on Instagram you have highlights. So you yeah, have yeah. that sort of, so I think in the highlights, she has a lot of great information about you know, do you need to boil water or not boil water? What's the difference between this and this? Why do you know? So I think in, in her Instagram, there's a lot of good information for that. And then there's someone else on Instagram called the formula fairy. So that, okay. that's somebody else who, and then I learned all of my information from Dr. Bridget Young. And so okay. she goes by the infant formula expert, but for whatever reason, she doesn't do a lot of Instagram. She's Oh, I feel like she was the other person I interviewed for. <laughs> remember oh, I said, really? remember I said I've done two formulas. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure that was the other one. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious. Dr. Bridget Young, she's very like chatty and upbeat. She's great. Yeah, yeah. Blonde, really yeah. fun, really blonde, it was a very right, right, fun right. conversation. She's a 
very energetic. Yeah, upbeat. That's exactly. That's so funny. I'm like, yep, out of my two formula feeding podcasts. There we are. I'll well, make sure I put this in the show notes for, for those listening. That is, that's really funny because she, I would say she's my formula mentor. When I did a um, in-depth study on formula so I could understand it better, I did it through her online class that, um, that was brilliant. I mean, uh, a, a, a parent can take that class too. It was very, very detailed and very, you know, nutrition heavy in a way that like, it's not part of my background. I had to really understand like protein molecules, whey and casein, amino acids, like all of that. But she explains it, I think in a very, um, very yeah, digestible just, way. Yeah. yeah she's Yeah. <laughs> I'll make sure I connect to that podcast as well, but yes. it's important because I think people do get overwhelmed. Like, again, I looked online and I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's so many different types, but I do appreciate you saying like, start with the basics and then see how your baby responds to that. Right. And uh, just another thing I want to say about the protein, uh, almost all the protein for all the formula in America is going to be cow's milk protein. We don't do a lot of goat's milk. We don't do any goat's milk formula. If anyone's going to feed goat's milk formula to their baby, they're going to have to import it from Europe or you or the UK, because we just, that's just not part of our you know, thing. Like we just, we don't drink goat's milk. We, we like goat cheese when it's with like arugula and beets, but we don't use goat's milk as a regular thing. And then soy of course is another alternative to protein. And I really don't find many pediatricians steering people towards soy based formula. Um, so there's a little bit more of a complicated story behind that, but I just want to like quickly say that formula in America is almost always going to be cow's milk. That's pretty much it. I I can't think of very many circumstances. Even when people are diagnosed, you know, they're like, oh, my baby has a cow's milk protein allergy. They still don't point you towards soy-based proteins. Mm. So I just want to put that out there. So in, in some respects that might it clear things up like, okay, there's, those are some choices that I could push aside for the moment, you know, okay. and really that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's funny without going too much on a tangent, as we wrap things up, I remember, um, when I was in India, goat was very popular. Cow was not. And then my husband was telling me, he's like, in most parts of the, of the world, goat is more popular than cow and chicken. I'm like, oh, that's so interesting. That's that, right. That's a little side. All right. So we're going to take another break, but when we come back, what is one final tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer new and expectant parents? And you can put on the hat as a parent. You can put on the postpartum doula hat, the breastfeeding counselor hat, whatever, whichever <laughs> role you'd like to take. All right. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back. So, what is one final tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer new and expectant parents? I think that expectant parents put so much emphasis on preparing for the baby and much less emphasis on how they're going to be doing, particularly the mother. I never teach a class without emphasizing what the newborn period feels like for the mother, the physiological changes, the, uh, the, the difficulties with breastfeeding that she may have, the lack of sleep, the hormonal changes, the urinary incontinence, the vaginal bleeding, the soreness, the stitches. Do I need to go on? I mean, uh, this is, I'm rattling this off, off the top of my head. And I just feel like people, if people were a little better prepared for taking care of themselves in the immediate postpartum period, everybody would do better. And that taking care of yourself also means prioritizing your mental health and well-being to be able to recognize this isn't working for me. I need to change it and not feeling one iota of guilt about that. Mm. Oh, I like that. Where can people find your work? (laughs) Um, so my Instagram, I suppose, Mama Rama, M-A-M-A-R-A-M-A underscore J-C. That was the name of my public access show, Mama Rama. So that's my channel on YouTube as well. 
And okay. that, that's from, oh, and I'm on TikTok too. TikTok is fun because I also, I, <laughs> I blend in a little true crime. I know it doesn't <laughs> go together. <laughs> But I feel like on TikTok, nobody's really paying attention except for like, you know, Gen Z's or something like, (laughs) you know, and and they're just like, what? Okay. She's talking about true crime and um, breastfeeding and, you know, in two different, (laughs) whatever. I don't know. It's just. uh, Well, make sure we put all that in the show notes, Jane. This has been so much fun. I really appreciate your humor and your down to earth approach. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you as well. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening.